It's Wednesday, November 9th, 2016. I crawl out of bed, blinking for a few moments to get accustomed to the world around me on this seemingly overcast day. It has all the elements of a slow, boring fall, maybe winterish day, but my heart picks up as I realize that the single most grueling presidential campaign of my lifetime has finally come to a conclusion. That conclusion, however, was unknown to me because my lovely parents forced me to go to bed before any major news network could project a winner. No fun. But upon waking up in the morning and getting ready for the day, I hurried downstairs, only to hear shocking news playing over the television. Due to something called the Electoral College, the candidate with millions of votes less than the leading candidate had won the election, and therefore the presidency. Now at this point in my life, I was too young to understand the complex electoral process or even the magnitude of the issues that the candidates ran on, but at the age of 10, I could firmly grasp that something had to be wrong. So over the last several years, I've tried to understand the Electoral College, how it functions, why it was devised, and the problems it creates for American society. And here's what I've learned. Plain and simple, the Electoral College is the system that the United States uses to elect its president. Each state, as opposed to individual citizens, is given a certain number of delegates, or electors, based on its total representation in Congress. More specifically, the number of electors a state receives is equal to the number of senators a state has in the United States Senate, which is two for every single state in the union, plus the number of representatives it has in the United States House, which varies based on state population. So if we look to our home state of California as an example, we'll see that in the next presidential election, we're going to have 54 electoral votes because we have 52 representatives and two senators. However, it's key to notice here that when you go and vote in the, the state of California for the presidential election, you're not directly voting for president. Instead, you're voting for who you think California should give its 54 electoral votes to. And the winner of the most votes in the state of California wins all of California's 54 electoral votes in a process known as winner take all, which exists in nearly every single state across the country. Now, if we zoom out for a minute and look at the macro level, we'll see that there are 538 electoral votes nationwide. So for a candidate to win the presidential election, they need 270 or a majority of these electoral votes. Now, this may all seem very complicated to you, and that's because it is. The Founding Fathers intentionally devised this system to, to take the power out of the hands of the people and into the hands of states and state legislators, who ultimately get the final say on where these electors go, due to their fear that if given the opportunity, ordinary citizens like you and me would either not have enough information to vote or have our own selfish interests in mind and accidentally elect a tyrant into office. However, in modern day America, these concerns really cease to exist. One, because with modern technology, we have access to all the information we could possibly ever need to evaluate every single candidate and ultimately cast our ballot. But two, every single state in the union chooses to give its electoral votes to the winner of their state, the popular vote, which is an inherently democratic and therefore not tyrannical process. Thus, the rationale for the derivation of the Electoral College really no longer applies, and there are no unique benefits to preserving the status quo or maintaining the Electoral College. Now you may ask, if there are no positives of the Electoral College, what are some of the negatives that come along with it? Well, there are two subtle issues with the Electoral College, which combined lead to the massive issue I was alluding to just a few moments ago, that of the loser winning. The first of these two subtle issues is that states receive two electoral votes regardless of population due to their senators, which gives small states, and as a result the people living in small states, a boost in both voting power and representation compared to those living in larger ones. So to illustrate this example more clearly, let's look at the California and Wyoming vote discrepancy. So our home state of California has about 40 million people, or 54 electoral votes, averaging out to about 730,000 people per elector while the state of Wyoming has about 590,000 people and three electoral votes, averaging out to about 190,000 people per elector. This means that, proportionally speaking, one person in Wyoming gets the same amount of political representation as 3.8 people in California. So as Californians, when you and I go and vote in the next presidential election in our state, our votes will be one-fourth as meaningful as some of our fellow citizens who live just over 1,000 miles away. Now, could you imagine going to a subway and paying four times more for the same sandwich as somebody else in line? Could you imagine paying $20 for a pastrami footlong? <laughs> you simply couldn't, it wouldn't make any sense. So how is it fair that some citizens, simply based on the state that they live in, have significantly less voting power than others? 
How is this possible in a country that is built upon the principles of fairness and equality for all of its citizens? Now, the other subtle issue with the Electoral College is the winner-take-all system that most states employ. Again, winner-take-all simply means that the candidate who wins the most votes in the state, not necessarily the majority, wins all of a state's electoral votes, regardless of how close the margin in the state actually is. So to illustrate this more clearly, let's look at a hypothetical election scenario in the state of California. So again, right, we have two candidates running in this state, and so one candidate gets about 58% of the vote, while the other candidate gets about 42% of the vote. Now, despite you may think, that candidate with 42% of the vote would have won millions of votes and millions of supporters across the state. However, they wouldn't receive a single one of California's 54 available electoral votes due to the winner-take-all system. There's no proportional allocation of these votes, no distributing these votes based on electoral performance. The winner simply gets all of the votes. Now, for this very reason right here, only a few states with the closest of margins are actually competitive in any given election cycle. Think about it. Candidates can safely ignore voters in states with wide margins of victory for either candidate because they know that even if they are to win a lot of votes, if they lose a state, they won't get a single consolation elector. In fact, we can see this play out with both Democrats and Republicans. Democrats have no reason to campaign in solid red states, nor do Republicans in solid blue states because the harsh reality is that they're unlikely to win. So whatever amount of money or time they spend in the state won't actually amount to anything. So they're better off campaigning and spending their advertising dollars in battleground states like Pennsylvania or Michigan. Now, what we see here uh, essentially is on this map here, a layout of all those visits on a campaign map. So we can actually see this reflected out on a campaign map for the 2020 presidential election from the two major presidential candidates after the primary season concluded. Now we can see here that the campaign visits that candidates take are extraordinarily concentrated in just a few states. In fact, 96% of all campaign visits go to just the top 12 most competitive battleground states in the nation. And 66% of visits go to just the top six most competitive swing states. Three out of the six most populated states in the entire country, including our very own home state of California, did not receive a single campaign visit during this time period. Not a single one. Virtually no money was spent in our state either, reflecting the candidates' lack of interest in our non-competitive states across the union. So instead of being persuaded by massive campaign events that made us feel like people were fighting for our votes, no candidate ever took the time to stop by. Now this has the effect of dramatically lowering turnout rates. Voters in non-competitive states, whether they support the majority or minority candidate, have no reason to turn out. One, because they know that their votes won't actually affect anything. But two, no candidate ever tries to get out the vote and tries to turn out as many voters as possible. While voters in competitive states with lots of campaign attention have every reason to turn out, which results in campaign visit levels and turnout rates actually in those 12 most competitive battleground states being 8% higher than in the 38 other states in the nation. Now, here comes the most crucial part. Due to a combination of the previous two factors, the two electoral votes regardless of population and the winner-take-all system that most states employ, the winner of the Electoral College can actually lose the popular vote or the most votes nationwide. In fact, this has happened two times in recent memory. The first in the year 2000, when candidate Al Gore lost to President George W. Bush in the Electoral College despite winning nationwide by about 500,000 votes, or 0.5%. And the second time was in 2016, when candidate Hillary Clinton lost to President Donald Trump in the Electoral College, despite winning nationwide by about 2.8 million votes, or 2.1%. And most frustratingly, this could reasonably happen again in 2024, given current party coalitions and a lack of solutions at our doorstep. Now, this really isn't a partisan issue, despite what you may think. There's no way to know who would win past elections or who will win future elections under a popular vote system because candidates would be forced to campaign in entirely different ways than they do today. However, the mere potential that a candidate could lose with more support than somebody else is blatantly wrong and unfair. The current status quo takes away power from the people and discourages engagement in our democracy. So the question remains, what can we do to fix this issue? Well, the obvious solution would be to amend the Constitution to abolish the Electoral College and replace it with a national popular vote nationwide. 
But as some of you may know, constitutional amendments are very rare because they require super majorities that everybody across the country has to agree upon. And this is simply not an issue that everybody agrees on. So a more subtle solution that's been floating around political circles since about 2006 is that of the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Now aside from being a mouthful every time I have to say it, what this compact would do is it would have states worth a total of 270 electoral votes sign onto an agreement to give their electoral votes to the winner of the popular vote and not necessarily the winner of their state. Now if you remember from the very beginning of this talk, states don't actually have to give their electoral votes to the winner of their own state they can give it to whoever they want. So this is a sneaky way of exploiting, or shall we say bypassing, the existing electoral infrastructure. Now currently, across the nation, 16 states, or 195 electoral votes, have been bound to the winner of the national po popular vote. Excuse me. However, it only takes effect once 270, or a majority of electoral votes nationwide, have been bound to the winner of the popular vote. But we're not that far off from it happening, because if four states pass this, Texas, Pennsylvania, Michigan, New Hampshire, it's through. And 270 electoral votes plus have successfully been bound to the winner of the popular vote. Thus making winning the electoral college and thus winning the presidency contingent upon first securing that electoral majority that now lies within the popular vote. And this would eliminate all three of the issues we've been talking about today. First, it would eliminate the issue of voter inequality because now you have a one person, one vote model nationwide and the candidate that wins the most votes nationwide wins the presidency. Secondly, it would get rid of the winner-take-all system because now candidates don't have to go to individual states. There are now millions of voters to win across our geographically diverse nation. So they would have to campaign all the way up north in Washington to California, Idaho, Montana, Kentucky, Indiana, a lot of states that typically wouldn't receive a whole lot of campaign attention, boosting turnout rates and increasing engagement in our democracy. And thirdly, and perhaps most importantly, the winner of the Electoral College can no longer win without the popular vote. Because those 270 electoral votes that you have to win to secure the majority only come if you win the popular vote. So there's no more of this freak scenario under which a candidate can win the Electoral College but then also lose the popular vote. So now the question becomes, what can you in the audience as individuals do to make this a reality? Well, there are two simple steps that you can take to help enhance the possibility that the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact passes. The first step is simply to spread the word. Tell people that you know. Tell your friends, tell your family, tell your extended family really. Tell whoever you know. And you can do this either verbally or online. But if you're gonna do it online, I would highly recommend sharing this TED Talk, which will be available on the TEDx YouTube page in just a couple months. Now, secondly, the other step is to contact state legislators. Now this is the more difficult of the two steps, but it has bigger impacts. So while gridlock exists over this issue on Capitol Hill right now, we can circumvent this by going directly to legislators in states that have not yet passed the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. Now, all you really have to do is give them a call or email them, which, is, which are pieces of information that you can find on their websites, and then tell them about the issue, tell them about what they can do, and tell them to try to introduce a bill to the floor of their state house and galvanize enough support to lead to its passage. Now, while many of you may be skeptical about the impact that a single email or single phone call can have on a congressperson, the reality is when these movements are performed in mass, they've worked in the past. In fact, just last year, in the year 2022, thousands of military veterans and their families successfully pushed for billions of dollars worth of military aid to those adversely impacted by burn pits, which exposed military veterans to uh, toxic chemicals while overseas. So this not only proves that change is possible, but it's achievable through our very own legislators, who, after all, are meant to represent us, the people that elect them. Now, I'd like to leave you all with this final word today. The office of the president plays a crucial role in both foreign policy issues abroad and domestic legislation here at home that impacts everyday Americans everywhere across the country. It is essential that every single voter in this nation gets an equal say on who that office holder will be to ensure fairness, strengthen democracy, and pass better legislation. Taking these simple steps will help fix our electoral process once and for all. Thank you.